Chapter 12. Schmal thinks of an answer to Bruno's question. All I know is this, began Schmal. Before we came here, I lived with my mother and my father and my brother Joseph in a small flat above the store where Papa makes his watches. Every morning we ate our breakfast together at 7 o'clock, and while we went to school, Papa mended the watches that people brought to him and made new ones too. I had a beautiful watch that he gave me, but I don't have it anymore. It had a golden face, and I wound it up every night before I went to sleep, and it always told the right time. What happened to it? asked Bruno. They took it from me, said Schmal. Who? The soldiers, of course, said Schmal, as if this was the most obvious thing in the world. And then one day things started to change, he continued. I came home from school, and my mother was making armbands for us from a special cloth and drawing a star on each one, like this. Using his finger, he drew a design in the dusty ground beneath him. And every time we left the house, she told us we had to wear one of those armbands. My father wears one too, said Bruno, on his uniform. It's very nice. It's bright red with a black and white design on it. Using his finger, he drew another design in the dusty ground on his side of the fence. Yes, but they're different, aren't they? said Schmal. No one's ever given me an armband, said Bruno. But I never asked to wear one, said Schmal. All the same, said Bruno, I think I'd quite like one. I don't know which one I'd prefer, though, your one or father's. Schmal shook his head and continued with his story. He didn't often think about these things anymore, because remembering his old life above the watch shop made him very sad. We wore the armbands for a few months, he said. And then things changed again. I came home one day, and Mama said we couldn't live in our house anymore. That happened to me too, shouted Bruno, delighted he wasn't the only boy who'd been forced to move. The fury came for dinner, you see, and the next thing I knew we moved here. And I hate it here, he said in a loud voice. Did he come to your house and do the same thing? No, but when we were told we couldn't live in our house, we had to move to a different part of Krakow, where the soldiers built a big wall, and my mother and father and brother and I all had to live in one room. All of you, asked Bruno, in one room. And not just us, said Schmal. There was another family there, and the mother and father were always fighting with each other, and one of the sons was bigger than me, and he hit me even when I did nothing wrong. You can't all have lived in one room, said Bruno, shaking his head. That doesn't make any sense. All of us, said Schmal, nodding his head, eleven in total. Bruno opened his mouth to contradict him again. He didn't really believe that eleven people could live in the same room together, but changed his mind. We lived there for some more months, continued Schmal, all of us in that one room. There was one small window in it, but I didn't like to look out of it because then I would see the wall, and I hated the wall because our real home was on the other side of it. And this part of town was the bad part because it was always noisy and it was impossible to sleep. And I hated Luca, who was the boy who kept hitting me, even when I did nothing wrong. Gretel hits me sometimes, said Bruno. She's my big sister, he added, in a hopeless case. But soon I'll be bigger and stronger than she is, and she won't know what's hit her then. Then one day the soldiers all came in with huge trucks, continued Schmal, who didn't seem all that interested in Gretel. And everyone was told to leave the houses. Lots of people didn't want to, and they hid wherever they could find a place. But in the end, I think they caught everyone. And the trucks took us to a train, and the train... He hesitated for a moment and then bit his lip. Bruno thought he was going to start crying and couldn't understand why. The train was horrible, said Schmal. There were too many of us in the carriages for one thing, and there was no air to breathe, and it smelled awful. That's because you all crowded onto one train, said Bruno, remembering the two trains he had seen at the station when he left Berlin. When we came here, there was another one on the other side of the platform, but no one seemed to see it. That was the one we got. You should have got on it, too. I don't think we would have been allowed, said Schmal, shaking his head. We weren't able to get out of the, our carriage. The doors were at the end, explained Bruno. There weren't any doors, said Schmal. Of course there were doors, said Bruno with a sigh. They're at the end, he repeated, just past the buffet section. There weren't any doors, insisted Schmal. If there had been, we all would have got off. Bruno mumbled something under his breath along the lines of, of course there were, but he didn't say it very loud so Schmal could hear. When the train finally stopped, continued Schmal, we were in a very cold place and we all had to walk here. We had a car, said Bruno, out loud now. And Mama was taken from us, and Papa and Joseph and I were put into the huts over there, and that's where we've been ever since. Schmal looked very sad when he told his story, and Bruno didn't know why. It didn't seem like such a terrible thing to him, and after all, much the same thing had happened to him. Are there many other boys over there? asked Bruno. Hundreds, said Schmal. Bruno's eyes opened wide. Hundreds, he said, amazed. That's not fair at all. There's no one to play with on this side of the fence, not a single person. We don't play, said Schmal. Don't play? Why ever not? What would we play, he asked, his face looking confused at the idea of it. 
Well, I don't know, said Bruno. All sorts of things. Football, for example, or exploration. What's the exploration like over there anyway? Any good? Schmal shook his head and didn't answer. He looked back towards the huts and turned back to Bruno then. He didn't want to answer, ask the next question, but the pains in his stomach took, made him. You don't have any food on you, do you? He asked. Afraid not, said Bruno. I meant to bring some chocolate, but I forgot. Chocolate, said Schmal very slowly, his tongue moving out from behind his teeth. I've only ever had chocolate once. Only once. I love chocolate. I can't get enough of it, although Mother says it'll rot my teeth. You don't have any bread, do you? Bruno shook his head. Nothing at all, he said. Dinner isn't served until half past six. What time do you have yours? Schmal shrugged his shoulders and pulled himself to his feet. I think I'd better get back, he said. Perhaps you can come to dinner with us one evening, said Bruno, although he wasn't sure it was a very good idea. Perhaps, said Schmal, although he didn't sound convinced. Or I could come to you, said Bruno. Perhaps I could come and meet your friends, he added hopefully. He had hoped that Schmal would suggest this himself, but there didn't seem to be any sign of that. You're on the wrong side of the fence, though, said Schmal. I could crawl under, said Bruno, reaching down and lifting the wire off the ground. In the center, between the wooden telegraph poles, it lifted quite easily, and a boy as small as Bruno could easily fit through. Schmal watched him do this and backed away nervously. I have to go back, he said. Some other afternoon, then, said Bruno. I'm not supposed to be here. If they catch me, I'll be in trouble. He turned and walked away, and Bruno noticed again just how small and skinny his new friend was. He didn't say anything about this because he knew only too well how unpleasant it was being criticized for something as silly as your height, and the last thing he wanted to do was be unkind to Schmal. I'll come back tomorrow, shouted Bruno to the departing boy, and Schmal said nothing in reply. In fact, he started to run off back to the camp, leaving Bruno all on his own. Bruno decided that that was more than enough exploration for one day, and he set off home, excited about what had happened and wanting nothing more than to tell Mother and Father and Gretel, who would be so jealous that she might explode, and Maria and Cook and Lars all about his adventure that afternoon, and his new friend with the funny name and the fact that they had the same birthday. But the closer he got to his own house, the more he started to think that that might not be a good idea. After all, he reasoned, they might not want me to be friends with him anymore, and if that happens, they might stop me from coming out here at all. By the time he went through his front door and smelled the beef that was roasting in the oven for dinner, he had decided it was for the better to keep this whole story to himself for the moment and not breathe a word about it. It would be his own secret. Well, his and Schmal's. Bruno was the, of the opinion that when it came to parents, and especially when it came to sisters, that what they didn't know couldn't hurt them. Chapter 13, The Bottle of Wine as week followed week, it started to become clear to Bruno that he would not be going home to Berlin in the foreseeable future, and that he could forget about sliding down the banisters in his comfortable home or seeing Carl or Darren, Daniel or Martin anytime soon. However, with each day that passed, he began to get used to being an out with and stopped feeling quite so unhappy about his new life. After all, it wasn't as if he had no one to talk to anymore. Every afternoon when classes were finished, Bruno took the long walk along the fence and sat and talked with his new friend Schmal until it was time to come home and that had started to make up for all the times he had missed Berlin. One afternoon, as he was filling his pockets with some bread and cheese from the kitchen fridge to take with him, Maria came in and stopped when she saw what he was doing. Hello, said Bruno, trying to appear as casual as possible. You gave me a fright I didn't hear you coming. You're not eating again, surely, asked Maria with a smile. You had lunch, didn't you, and you're still hungry? A little, said Bruno. I'm going for a walk, and I thought I might get peckish on the way. Maria shrugged her shoulders and went over to the cooker, where she put a pan of water on to boil. Lay down on the surface beside it was a pile of potatoes and carrots, ready for peeling when Pavel arrived later in the afternoon. Bruno was about to leave when the food caught his eye, and a question came into his mind that had been bothering him for some time. He hadn't been able to think of anyone to ask before, but this seemed like a perfect moment and the perfect person. Maria, he said, can I ask you a question? The maid turned round and looked at him in surprise. Of course, Master Bruno, she said. And if I ask you this question, will you promise not to tell anyone that I asked it? She narrowed her eyes suspiciously, but nodded. All right, she said. What is it you want to know? It's about Pavel, she said Bruno. You know him, don't you? The man who comes and peels the vegetables and then waits on us at table. Oh, yes, said Maria with a smile. She sounded relieved that his question wasn't going to be about anything more serious. I know Pavel. We've spoken on many occasions. Why do you ask about him? Well, said Bruno, choosing his words quite carefully in case he said something he shouldn't. Do you remember soon after we got here when I made the swing on the oak tree and fell and cut my knee? Yes, said Maria. It's not hurting you again, is it? 
No, it's not that, said Bruno. But when I heard it, Pavel was the only grown-up around, and he brought me in here and cleaned it and washed it and put the green ointment on it, which stung, but I suppose it made it better. And then he put a bandage on it. That's what anyone would do if someone's hurt, said Maria. I know, he continued. Only he told me then that he wasn't really a waiter at all. Maria's face froze a little, and she didn't say anything for a moment. Instead, she looked away and licked her lips a little before nodding her head. I see, she said. And what did he say he was, really? He said he was a doctor, said Bruno, which didn't seem right at all. He's not a doctor, is he? No, said Maria, shaking her head. No, he's not a doctor. He's a waiter. I knew it, said Bruno, feeling very pleased with himself. Why did he lie to me, then? It doesn't make any sense. Pavel is not a doctor anymore, Bruno, said Maria quietly. But he was, in another life, before he came here. Bruno frowned and thought about it. I don't understand, he said. Few of us do, said Maria. But if he was a doctor, why isn't he one still? Maria sighed and looked out of the window to make sure that no one was coming, then nodded towards the chairs, and both she and Bruno sat down. If I tell you what Pavel told me about his life, she said, you mustn't tell anyone, do you understand? We would all get in terrible trouble. I won't tell anyone, said Bruno, who loved to hear secrets and almost never spread them around, except when it was totally necessary, of course, and there was nothing he could do about it. All right, said Maria, this is as much as I know. Bruno was late arriving at the place in the fence where he met Schmal every day, but as usual, his new friend was sitting cross-legged on the ground waiting for him. I'm sorry I'm late, said, he said, handing some of the bread and cheese through the wire, the bits he hadn't already eaten on the way when he had grown a little peckish after all. I was talking to Maria. Who's Maria? asked Schmal, not looking up as he gobbled down the food hungrily. She's our maid, explained Bruno. She's very nice, although father says she's overpaid. But she was telling me about this man, Pavel, who chops our vegetables for us and waits on table. I think he lives on your side of the fence. Schmal looked up for a moment and stopped eating. On my side, he asked. Yes, do you know him? He's very old and has a white jacket that he wears when he's serving dinner. You've probably seen him. No, said Schmal, shaking his head. I don't know him. But you must, said Bruno irritably, as if Schmal was being deliberately difficult. He's not as tall as some adults, and he has gray hair and stoops over a little. I don't think you realize just how many people live on this side of the fence, said Schmal. There are thousands of us. But this one's name is Pavel, insisted Bruno. When I fell off my swing, he cleaned out the cut so I didn't get infected and put a bandage on my leg. Anyway, the reason I wanted to tell you about him is because he's from Poland, too, like you. Most of us here are from Poland, said Schmal. Although some are from other places too, like Czechoslovakia and... Yes, but that's why I thought you might know him. Anyway, he was a doctor in his hometown before he came here, but he's not allowed to be a doctor anymore. And if father had known that he had cleaned my knee when I hurt myself, then there would have been trouble. The soldiers don't normally like people getting better, said Schmal, swallowing the last piece of bread. It usually works the other way round. Bruno nodded, even though he didn't quite know what Schmal meant, and gazed up into the sky. After a few moments, he looked through the wire and asked another question that had been preying on his mind. Do you know what you want to be when you grow up? He asked. Yes, said Schmal. I want to work in a zoo. A zoo? asked Bruno. I like animals, said Schmal quietly. I'm going to be a soldier, said Bruno in a determined voice, like father. I wouldn't like to be a soldier, said Schmal. I don't mean one like Lieutenant Kotler, said Bruno quickly, not one who strides around as if he owns the place and laughs with your sister and whispers with your mother. I don't think he's a good soldier at all. I mean one like father, one of the good soldiers. There aren't any good soldiers, said Schmal. Of course there are, said Bruno. Who? Well, father for one, said Bruno. That's why he has such an impressive uniform and why everyone calls him commandant and does whatever he says. The Fury has big things in mind for him because he's such a good soldier. There aren't any good soldiers, repeated Schmal. Except father, repeated Bruno, who was hoping that Schmal wouldn't say that again because he didn't want to have to argue with him. After all, he was the only friend he had here at Outwith. But father was father, and Bruno didn't think it was right for someone to say something bad about him. Both boys stood very quiet for a few moments, neither wanting to say anything he might regret. You don't know what it's like here, said Schmalf eventually in a low voice, his words barely carrying across to Bruno. You don't have any sisters, do you? asked Bruno quickly, pretending he hadn't heard that because he would have, wouldn't have to answer. No, said Schmal, shaking his head. You're lucky, said Bruno. Gretel's only 12 and she thinks she knows everything, but she's a hopeless case, really. She sits looking out of her window, and when she sees Lieutenant Kotler coming, she runs downstairs into the hallway and pretends she was standing there all along. The other day, I caught her doing it, and when he came in, she jumped and said, Why, Lieutenant Kotler, I didn't know you were here, and I know for a fact she was waiting for him. Bruno hadn't been looking at Schmal as he said all that, but when he looked again, he noticed his friend had grown even more pale than usual. 
What's wrong, he asked. You look as if you're going to be sick. I don't like talking about him, said Schmal. About who, asked Bruno. Lieutenant Kotler. He scares me. He scares me a little too, admitted Bruno. He's a bully, and he smells funny. It's all that cologne he puts on. And then Schmal started to shiver slightly, and Bruno looked around, as if he could see rather than feel whether it was cold or not. What's the matter, he asked. It's not that cold, is it? You should have brought a jumper, you know. The evenings are getting chillier. Later that evening, Bruno was disappointed to find that Lieutenant Kotler was joining him, mother, father, and Gretel for dinner. Pavel was wearing his white jacket as usual and served them as they ate. Bruno watched Pavel as he went around the table and found that he felt sad whenever he looked at him. He wondered whether the white jacket he wore as a waiter was the same as the white jacket he had worn before as a doctor. As he brought the plates in and set them down in front of each of them, and while they ate their food and talked, he stepped back toward the wall and held himself perfectly still, neither looking ahead nor not. It was as if his body had gone to sleep standing up, with his eyes open. Whenever anyone needed anything, Bruno would bring it immediately. But the more Bruno watched him, the more he was sure that catastrophe was going to strike. He seemed to grow smaller and smaller each week, as if such a thing were possible. And the color that should have been in his cheeks had drained almost entirely away. His eyes appeared heavy with tears, and Bruno thought that one good blink might bring on a torrent. When Pavel came in with the plates, Bruno couldn't help but notice that his hands were shaking slightly under the weight of them. And when he stepped back to his usual position, he seemed to sway on his feet and had to press a hand against the wall to steady himself. Mother had to ask twice for her extra helping of soup before he heard her, and he let the bottle of wine empty without having opened another one in time to fill Father's glass. Herr Liest won't let us read poetry or plays, complained Bruno, Bruno during the main course. As they had company for dinner, the family were dressed formally, father in his uniform, mother in a green dress that set off her eyes, and Gretel and Bruno in the clothes they wore to church when they had lived in Berlin. I asked him if we could read them just one day a week, but he said no, not while he was in charge of our education. I'm sure he has his reasons, said father, attacking a leg of lamb. All he wants us to do is study history and geography, said Bruno, and I'm starting to hate history and geography. Don't say hate, Bruno, please, said mother. Why do you hate history, asked father, laying down his fork for a moment and looking cr across the table at his son, who shrugged his shoulders, a bad habit of his. Because it's boring, he said. Boring, said father, a son of mine calling the study of history boring. Let me tell you this, Bruno, he went on, leaning forward and pointing his knife at the boy. It's history that's got us here today. If it wasn't for history, none of us would be sitting around this table now. We'd be safe back at our table in our house in Berlin. We are correcting history here. It's still boring, repeated Bruno, who wasn't really paying attention. You'll have to forgive my brother, Lieutenant Kotler, said Gretel, laying a hand on his arm for a moment, which made Mother stare at her and narrow her eyes. He's a very ignorant little boy. I am not ignorant, snapped Bruno, who had had enough of her insults. You'll have to forgive my sister, Lieutenant Kotler, he added politely, but she's a hopeless case. There's very little we can do for her. The doctor says she's gone past the point of help. Shut up, said Gretel, blushing scarlet. You shut up, said Bruno, with a broad smile. Children, please, said mother. Father tapped his knife on the table, and everyone was silent. Bruno glanced in his direction. He didn't look angry exactly, but he did look as if he wasn't going to put up with this much more arguing. I enjoyed history very much when I was a boy, said Lieutenant Kotler after a few silent moments, and although my professor, father was a professor of literature at the university, I preferred the social sciences to the arts. I didn't know that, Kurt, said mother, turning to look at him for a moment. Does he still teach then? I suppose so, said Lieutenant Kotler. I don't really know. Well, how could you not know, she asked, frowning at him. Don't you keep in touch with him? The young lieutenant chewed on a mouthful of lamb, and it gave him an opportunity to think of a reply. He looked to Bruno as if he regretted having brought up the matter in the first place. Kurt, repeated mother, don't you keep in touch with your father? Not really, he replied, shrugging his shoulders dismissively and not turning his head to look at her. He left Germany some years ago, 1938 I think it was, and I haven't seen him since. Father stopped eating for a moment and stared across at Lieutenant Kotler, frowning slightly. And where did he go? he asked. I beg your pardon, Herr Commandant, said Lieutenant Kotler, even though Father had spoken in a perfectly clear voice. I asked you where he went, he repeated. Your father, the professor of literature. Where did he go when he left Germany? Lieutenant Kotler's face grew a little red, and he stuttered somewhat as he spoke. I believe, I believe he is currently in Switzerland, he said finally. The last thing I heard, he was teaching at a university in Bern. Oh, but Switzerland's a beautiful country, mother quickly. I haven't ever been there, I admit, but from what I hear, he can't be very old, your father, said father, his deep voice silencing them all. I mean, you're only, what, 17, 18 years old? I just turned 19, Herr Commandant. 
So your father would be in his 40s, I expect. Lieutenant Kotler said nothing, but continued to eat, although he didn't appear to be enjoying his food at all. Strange that he chose not to stay in the fatherland, said father. We're not close, my father and I, said Lieutenant Kotler quickly, looking around the table as if he owed everyone an explanation. Really, we haven't spoken in years. And what reason did he give, might I ask, continued father, for leaving Germany at the moment of her greatest glory and her most vital need, when it is incumbent upon all of us to play our part in the national revival? Was he tubercular? Lieutenant Kotler stared at father confused. I beg your pardon, he asked. Did he go to Switzerland to take the air, explained father, or did he have a particular reason for leaving Germany? In 1938, he added after a moment. I'm afraid I don't know, Herb commanded, said Lieutenant Kotler. You would have to ask him. Well, that would be rather difficult to do, wouldn't it, with him being so far away, I mean. But perhaps that was it. Perhaps he was ill. Father hesitated before picking up his knife and fork again and continuing to eat. Or perhaps he had disagreements. Disagreements, Herr Commandant, with government policy. One hears tales of men like this from time to time. Curious fellows, I imagine. Disturbed, some of them. Traitors, other. Cowards, too. Of course, you have infirmed your superiors of your father's views, Lieutenant Kotler. The young lieutenant opened his mouth and swallowed, despite the fact that he hadn't been eating anything. Never mind, said father cheerfully. Perhaps it is not an appropriate subject of conversation for the dinner table. We can discuss it more in depth at a later time. Herr Commandant, said Lieutenant Kotler, leaning forward anxiously, I can assure you it is not an appropriate subject of conversation for the dinner table, repeated father sharply, silencing him immediately. And Bruno looked from one to the other, both enjoying and being frightened by the atmosphere at the same time. I'd love to go to Switzerland, said Gretel after a lengthy silence. Eat your dinner, Gretel, said mother. But I was just saying, eat your dinner, repeated mother, and was about to say more when she was interrupted by father calling for Pavel again. What's the matter with you tonight, he asked as Pavel uncorked the new bottle. This is the fourth time I've had to ask for more wine. Bruno watched him, hoping he was feeling all right, although he managed to release the cork without any accidents. But after he filled father's glass and turned to refill Lieutenant Kotler's, he lost his grip of the bottle somehow, and it fell crashing, glug, glug, glugging its contents out directly onto the young man's lap. What happened then was both unexpected and extremely unpleasant. Lieutenant Kotler grew very angry with Pavel, and no one, not Bruno, not Gretel, not mother, and not even father, stepped in to stop him from doing what he did next, even though none of them could watch, even though it made Bruno cry and Gretel grow pale. Later that night, when Bruno went to bed, he thought about all that had happened over dinner. He remembered how kind Pavel had been to him on the afternoon he made the swing, and how he had stopped his knee from bleeding, and had been very gentle in the way he administered the green ointment. And while Fa Bruno realized that Father was generally a very kind and thoughtful man, it hardly seemed fair or right that no one had stopped Lieutenant Kotler getting so angry at Pavel. And if that was the kind of thing that went on and out with, then he'd better not disagree with anyone anymore about anything. In fact, he would do well to keep his mouth shut and cause no chaos at all. Some people might not like it. His old life in Berlin seemed like a very distant memory now, and he could hardly even remember what Carl, Daniel, or Martin looked like, except for the fact that one of them was a ginger.